name is John Walrath. I'm the Imaging Training and Technical Support Manager for Data Color. Um, I've, uh, uh, maybe we'll just start off with um, this image. So the, everything photographic for, photographically for me has started with, with this image. This was my first selfie. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, my father was an avid, is an avid photographer. Um, most of my childhood uh, photos were in black and white. He, um, we had a black and white uh, dark room in our um, basement growing up, and um, you know most of his photography, uh, you know, f during my childhood was related to photographing me and my brother. Um, this did a pretty. This is very influential for me because it didn't. It, it it related to me the the importance of photography in somebody's life. Um, now I don't. I'll show you some of my work here, but um, most of my work doesn't revolve around sh phot photographing people. But really, the importance of photography in some ways life is uh, was really modeled through what my father did. Um, we, you know, we regularly uh, went down to the basement to, you know, this is a, a gray backdrop that he had installed in our our basement. You know, he regularly unrolled that, and we, um, my brother and I went out and or. You know, we had photo photo sessions in our basement. Um, every Christmas card was done, um, you know, uh, on the near the banister of our uh, home that we grew up in. Um, so there's a lot of memories tied to photography in my childhood. Um, I did a lot of uh, uh, you know science fair projects, um, if you will, uh, uh, in my younger days. Um, was involved involving photography, but um, photography had a big um, play or important part of my life. Um, uh, you know, I grew up, I uh, went to college. I started off doing uh, math and science, uh, but I eventually changed majors and um, I got a degree in interior architecture. Um, and I uh, really decided to, I guess in, in college, really decided to follow my passion uh, to do something a little more creative. Um, and I moved to Williamsburg, uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, not uh, New York, <laughs> um, and began working for Colony Williamsburg. Uh, I was a interior. I was. I worked in the interior design studio there. Um, you know, uh, briefly for about two years, and then I had the opportunity to open my own business. Um, built that business for about six years and sold it in 2011 to become a full-time photographer. Um, I spent uh, my my professional work was uh, in interior and. Um, architectural photography, so I worked for builders, ad agencies, um, interior designers, uh, photographing in their interiors uh, for, to the use in their marketing material. So this was really kind of where I got the introduction to Data Colors Products, uh, who I work for now. Um, you know, the importance of monitor calibration, the importance of, of color management and a workflow uh, was really, you know, I, I learned a lot of it reproducing those interiors for uh, those clients. Um, so uh, about two years ago, I began working full time for Data Color. Uh, my role is the Imaging Training and Technical Support Manager. So everything that I do revolves around making sure our customers and our resellers know how to use um, our product. Um, so that involves training and, and, and such. So I'm very fortunate to have a, um, uh, a, uh, that photography is this important in my uh, life today. So um, my personal work, um, I love photographing interiors, uh, but I'm really passionate about doing landscape work. Um, I've been fortunate enough to go to places like Iceland. Um, this is in Valley of Fire uh, State Park outside of um, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, this is here in New York, Outer Banks. Um, a, love infrared photography. Uh, if anybody's interested in infrared photography, please come up and talk to me about it later. Um, it's just a, a real passion of mine. Uh, this was uh, you know, Paramount Studios. I was doing an event for, um, it was a video related event. Um, so a lot of the attendees were video, uh, video guys. I'm more of a still photographer. This was on the, Mount, the Paramount Studios lot. So I, I stop to take a photograph of this, this scene, and then I get this. I, I look up after a couple shots, and there's 
five or six guys around trying to look and see what I'm doing, and they're thinking I'm shooting video of this puddle, um, where it wasn't a video of the puddle, it was a, a picture of the puddle. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see how everybody kind of gathered and wanted to see what video I was taking, but it was actually still. Um, so I think that's kind of a, that was kind of a, a funny moment for me that I always remember when I see this image. Um, a lot of what you see here is landscape. That's what I really love doing. There's more infrared. Um, this is probably my favorite example of an interior, photo uh, interior photograph that I've delivered to a client. Um, I just, a lot of my work revolved around um, just good clean images of um, you know, interiors that really showed the property well. Um, and a lot of that was related to what I would, to data colors, use of data colors products. But what I'm really here to talk about is, is um, how my life changed photographically um, when my daughter was born. So the birth of, uh, uh, becoming a parent is, you know, probably the understatement of the year is it changes things. Um, I've, you know, one thing I've recently done is I've really took stock of what, my, what I'm doing photographically. Um, anything from the equipment that I have, uh, the skills that I have, or the skills that I don't have, just kind of, um, you know, I just took a, uh, just kind of one of those moments where I know that, um, you know, learning photography is a life term, lifetime pursuit and just kind of stopping and saying where do I want which direct where, where do I want the direction of my photographic pursuits um, and I you know one thing I look back is all the images that I've taken of my daughter in the past um, uh, the past year and a half she's a year and a half now and um, really it got me thinking about um, you know how to compile uh, you know what I've done um, because for me, before Olivia was born, uh, I did very little photography of people. Um, a headshot here and now, here and then, um, a wedding for under special, uh, but not for everybody. You know, it was, it was very special circumstances. But um, most of my, photo my photography has been of Olivia um, in the last year. So putting this together it kind of really got me thinking about, um, you know, uh, or looking back on the images I've made, it really got me thinking about what I'm doing photographically. So, um, what I want to do is 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 kind of prepare a, or talk about uh, first capturing memorable moments, second developing memorable moments, and then sharing memorable moments. So, uh, three different topics. So, kind of the start from you know the capture stage to the edit stage to the um, you know what are you going to do with the file stage. Um, and this can be done through, you know, I could have used a lot of my other images, but I wanted to take uh, what I've primarily photographed over the last year is my daughter, Olivia. So capturing memorable moments, um, you know, this really kind of, if you were to pick a phrase that this is about, it, that kind of sums up this is, is anticipate. Um, so you're, you're preparing for moments. Uh, to capture here. So again, preparing for the situation. So you ask yourself, um, so what are some of the questions that you, before you go out and photograph, what are some of the questions that you, um, you know, ask yourself? Subject. Right. What are you going to be photographing? Um, you know, what kind of camera you need, what kind of lenses um, prepare you to, to take the images that you want to take? Um, so I mean, this is this is kind of basic stuff. We're starting very foundational here. Um, so you kind of have to, you kind of have in mind what you want to accomplish photographically, and then work, you know, be able to have the equipment you need to uh, adapt as you have to. Um, so it's very, that's also very important to know your uh, equipment. Um, I, uh, in high school, I was a, a, a catcher for our baseball team, and. Um, so a lot of, you know, we, there's a lot of technique involved in being a catcher on a baseball team. Um, so we did a lot of practice of, you know, certain moves and a lot of these things became muscle memory, um, as they call it in sports. So, um, you know, preparing for the situation, um, you know, that can involve situational training, uh, you know, knowing your equipment, 
um, help you react to get better uh, images. Um, it also helps for you to know your, um, know your subject. You're able to better photograph them. Um, so, uh, you know, in, for me, you know, photographing children was new about a year and a half ago. So um, probably the first tip I have from looking at through all my images um, is, is to get down to their level. So, you know, a photograph is, should, you know, relate something to the viewer about the, the subject. Um, it can stir emotions in the, the viewer. I mean, there's a lot of things that a photograph can do. Um, so you want to, especially with children, you want to try to make a connection. This is Olivia in the snow. Um, you know, I think it's a nice picture, but there's really no connection with her uh, in this. So getting down to her level, though, you're able to, to kind of see the world through her eyes. You're able to get her perspective. Um, and that's something in, that's kind of unique about kids. You know, they, they, they're learning, a lot of things are in life are new for them, especially if the younger children. Um, and they're just discovering and, and getting down to their level can help uh, convey that to your, um, your viewer. You know, something like this at their eye level. And even this. This is right before she went out when I took this one. So another, another tip would be to take lots of images. Um, we're in Colonial Williamsburg here. And um, you know, if you're not familiar with Colonial Williamsburg, it's the restored colonial capital of, of, um, of Virginia. There's, it's, uh, there's about 100 or so historic buildings. It looks very authentic. And this is on one of the porches of um, one of the buildings. So Olivia is just sitting there or looking through the bars. Um, you, know, you don't have to keep you know, we're talking about a lot of you know, taking a lot of pictures. You don't have to keep the, the um, you know, the shutter down all the time, but you want to anticipate what's going to happen. So, you know, firing shots is not going to, it doesn't cost you anything digitally. So uh, you can, um, you'll, you're better prepared to capture the moment when it does come. So this is the first, this is before, and that's a much stronger. This is moments later. Um, and then I think this is nice, but it's, it's, after the moment, I think this was the stronger shot. So, don't be afraid to fire the the, the camera. And again, here's a picture. And she sees something that you get a, an expression that you just can't recreate, and you just have to be ready for. And another one. This is we're probably uh, look. There's a lot of uh, during certain times of the year, Colonial Williamsburg has sheep. Um, Olivia absolutely loves sheep. She calls them babas. Um, and what we're doing here is just looking at the sheep. So this is before something happens, something catches her eye, and you know you can't recreate that type of moment. And then something catches my wife's eye. <laughs> so something I had to learn uh, before, um, you know, before I didn't use flash much. Um, and that's something I really learned to embrace um, photographing Olivia. Um, how many people feel comfortable using flash on the camera or off camera? Yeah, so most of the, most of the photographers that I, kind of, I would say I run with, you know, uh, they would think flash is, is uh, playing with lightning, um, where it's really not. Uh, the, the camera manufacturers makes, make it very easy having the TTL flash. Um, You know, uh, it just it, it makes it very simple to get very nice images. You know, lighting principle is you want to have, you know, the problem with on-camera flash is that you that you have a small light source that's narrowly focused that it's it's very directional, um, and the you know the way you get nicer light is to have a, a larger light source that's diffused, um, and so you can use a lot of um, I don't. I barely use flash without using something like the the Rogue Flash Bender. Um, it's just it does a for me it does a very good job. It has you know for this model you have the ability to use it as a small soft box, or to take this off 
and use that as a larger bounce card. Um, using a, you know, what I found is using a um, device like this, it helps create a larger light source, gives you light from above if you're inside, and really does a, a nice job of making things look really natural. Um, have you ever f had this experience happen when you've had, you know, photographing somebody with flash and they just blink all the time? Um, well, that's actually because the way the, the you know, for some people, or for, for the TTL flash, it sends out two pulses. Uh, the first pulse is often okay for people, but um, sometimes people are very susceptible to those multiple flashes. Um, Olivia is at, at times. Um, it's, it's really not that bad with her, but um, so there's actually a way you can have the pre-flash as a custom function on your camera. Um, so uh, I'm not sure which cameras actually do that, but um, my D800 will, will do that. And that's something I've uh, learned to do to, to kind of help eliminate um, you know, Olivia from blinking or anybody from blinking for that matter. I'm um, just going to really touch briefly on composition. I think everybody has you know, read about composition. Composition's talked about uh, everywhere. Um, so I'm not going to really get into uh, specifics, but um, you know, we're talking about things like the, you know, are they rules or, or not rules? You know, it, I think they're probably just better guidelines uh, than anything. You know, you're thinking, uh, you know, talk about rule of thirds. Everybody knows that one. You're thinking about um, pattern. You're thinking about how to frame your subject using a, a shape that's that you find in the frame. Um, one compositional technique that I've really liked that I kind of think I got from um, my architectural days is a more of a one-point perspective. Um, this is called leading lines, but um, it's something I really have found I think is powerful with, with kids because you, um, you know, you're showing, a, um, it, it's very strong how it draws your eye to the viewer, or eye to the subject. Um, one thing to think about at, when you're capturing uh, memorable moments or, or out photographing is to think about how to speed your developing up. Um, two products that Datacolor makes that does this um, are the Spider Checker 24 and Spider Cube. Um, Spider Cube is meant as a, a reference point that you can include in um, an image, um, and it's just used to get a white balance um, reading so you can apply that to multiple images. So you know, this is, we were taking pictures of the pumpkin patch and um, you know, I just took this image of the, the spider cube as a reference point so I would have, um, so I could go into my Im editing software and use the white balance eyedropper to pick off the brighter side of the gray. Um, this day was pretty overcast so there really wasn't a directional light source. Um, but when you have a directional light source you'll see that one of the the gray side is going to be brighter than the other. And that's the side you actually use to get a white balance um, uh, reading with a white balance eyedropper. Um, so that's a quick a way to get a quick neutral, you know, you're neutralizing the, the influence of the light source on your subject. That can help make skin tones uh, a lot nicer. Um, you know, you can go in there and play with sliders and apply everything, but you're ending up, you know, you're, you're pushing and pulling sliders um, you know, sometimes uh, you know, a one-click solution is a lot quicker, and then you can apply that, um, uh, you know, the white balance setting to everything. Spider Checker is used to create um, more accurate uh, capture. So this will actually adjust the color of your, of your images based on how your camera and lens uh, works together. So the workflow for Spider Checker this is not a location target, so you capture this with, the, with each camera and lens combination you have. You run those images through our software. Our software will make profiles for each camera and lens you have. Those profiles or, or user presets, excuse me, can be applied after capture to get color more accurate. Um, and that can be really nice uh, for skin tones. Um, how many people here shoot video? Yeah, good. Um, so, video for me is is pretty much 
uh, an iPhone exercise. Um, I don't do much with um, uh, you know anything else besides that. But video adds something that that a still photograph can't. Um, you know, it adds a, a sense of movement and and. Yeah. Where's your head? Oh. Um, it just does something that stills can't do. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, I, I what I've tried to start doing is is taking more videos of Olivia, um, in capturing moments like this. Yeah. Where's your head? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Where's your belly? Where's your belly? Oh, that's your head. Yeah, that's your head. Good job. That's your head. Yeah, yeah. How about your toes? Do you remember where your toes are? Toes? Toes? That's your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's something that a, you know, a still photograph can't, can't relay as, as good as video. So. Um, you know, keep video in your repertoire. Hi. Mommy. Call, call mommy on the phone. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Are you on hold? Yeah, so, you know, think about video. It's, it's something I've had to start um, purposefully doing, uh, because my first instinct is to go to, for a still photograph. Um, but it, it does show, you know, as photographers, we're very um, very well prepared to shoot uh, video uh, with our, you know, with what we know how to do to still shoot fil uh, stills. All right. So developing memorable moments. Um, you know, if I were to, um, you know, create a keyword for this, it's uh, refining what you've captured. You know, that's uh, of course. So there's a lot of things you can do. To refine, this is uh, this is sometimes where a lot of the your vision and communication comes to life. Um, so in the digital world, we, you know, it, it's just a, uh, imperative that we just we have to spend time in front of a computer. Um, you know, I I spend most of my work day in front of a computer, and sometimes it can be hard to to uh, you know come home and 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 sit in front of a computer and do something creative. But it's something that. Um, you know, it's it's part of our digital lives today. Um, how many people enjoy the editing of photos? Uh, what was that? How many people enjoy that the best of of best part of photography? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, you know, it's it's a lot of a lot of your creative expression can come out here. And I think it's really um, you know, I think you should you know, with so much with our daily lives spent so much. Uh, some, with so much time spent in our daily lives in front of a computer, I think you are, uh, it's important to th have a couple things in mind that where you're, about your environment that you're uh, editing in. Um, you want to you know, think about things like you, know, you want your lighting to be subdued. Uh, that can help with you know, um, you know, your, your attention to the screen, you know, your color perception. Um, and just it, it's easier on your eyes and easier on everything. Um, you know, you want to get a comfortable chair, something that's ergon ergonomic, um, a desk at the right height. You want to have a good quality monitor. Um, you want, and this is, again, will be easier on your eyes. This makes, um, you know, sitting down to, to edit photos and, and doing something creative, it makes it um, much more enjoyable. Um, think about other things like, um, uh, again, you want a creative, or you want a, a good, capable computer. Of course, but think about things like ambiance. You know, are you ha are you? Is there music you like to play that, that you're more creative, uh, that you feel more creative having on? Um, you know, for me, there's several 
CDs that I listen to that if I need to write, if I need to do something creative, those just kind of help put me in the mindset of doing something. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not just something that triggers in my head that um, it's just very helpful and, and I can kind of get into the zone. Um, and that's part of your environment. Um, uh, you know, where you are physically in your room. I mean, this is, um, maybe this is more important for me uh, in a sense here, because um, just kind of some of my background and how I see the world. But I think, um, I think it's important that you, that you, have, that you pre prepare your environment uh, for what you're going to do uh, creatively at the computer. Um, so how many people coming into this were familiar with data color? OK. Um, how many people calibrate their uh, displays? OK. Um, so I, I want to just touch briefly on you know, what monitor calibration is. We'll go through. Um, you know, a couple tips and, and reasons, but monitor calibration is is I consider it the the backbone of, of digital image editing uh, or digital image workflow. Um, how many people have had a contractor work on their home or um, have ever hired a contractor? Okay, what what do you think the most important tool is that any contractor has? A level, that's good. Yeah. Experience. Experience, Measuring definitely. Tape. I'm sorry? Measuring tape. Measuring tape. You're, you're right on the mark here. Um, uh, yeah, everybody has a measuring tape. They all have, you know, if somebody's building, if a contractor's building a house, they're looking at plans. Those plans have a specific scale, um, you know, uh, whatever that may be, but there's a way to convert it to inches or, or feet, wherever, just depends on where you're, you're working. But there is a, a reference point for, to get consistency from contractor to contractor. Um, with, with photography, we have the same thing. Um, we have uh, a, a color management system uh, that's industry standard uh, that, we, that we will calibrate your monitor to. Um, and they, what we're doing is we're calibrating your display so um, you know, you can accurately edit your photos um, and then help you get consistent output um, for whatever you decide to do with your photos. Um, the first rationale for, for monitor calibration is all monitors cal or display colors a little bit differently. Um, each display has its own unique fingerprint. Um, it dis it, the contrast is, is a little bit different from display to display. Colors. Uh, your images will show differently, um, and you know with each with the inconsistencies of of displays, um, if you're trying to make a print, your print's not going to look like what you see on screen. Uh, if your no, if your monitor is not calibrated to what your printer will output, um, you will not get as good screen to print match. So um, when your uh, monitor is calibrated, you have uh, image colors or the, the image colors, um, you can edit them so that you can reproduce what's what you see. Um, color is is something that's perceived, and it can be an emotional thing. But there's a, a scientific foundation for what red is, what green is, what blue is, um, and that's what's being applied uh, here. Um, you know, one thing that monitor calibration does is it can help you save time and money um, if you're you know if you're going through a print edit, print, or print, tweak, print, tweak type process, uh, first of all, it's not enjoyable. Um, you don't see what's on your, you know, you don't have an accurate view of what you're going to actually be able to print. You won't see it on screen. Um, and it's an actual, that's a very important part of, of, uh, of photography and, and printing, is being able to see a, a preview on screen before you actually make the print. So monitor calibration can, um, it's a very simple process about 10 minutes once a month um, to keep everything in, um, you know, consistent. Um, and it's a software calibration, so it's making an adjustment to the, vi to the video card. Uh, it's not actually changing the display itself. Um, but it can help make multiple displays consistent. It helps keep your monitor, or keeps your, keep, gives you the ability to, to see what you're going to get um, uh, when you want to make a print, whether that's at home or through a lab. 
um, and it allows you to work together with other photographers if you're uh, collaborating. So there's a lot of things that monitor calibration does, but uh, it really comes down to um, you know, having a, a consistent, accurate screen that you can trust over a, a longer period of time. So the editing process, um, or the developing process, um, really is kind of where a lot of the, you know, where the raw materials are that you're going that you captured, um, where a lot of things can come to life here. Um, one thing you want to do is you want to really use this, um, you know, you can consider it a journey. Even you know, you're taking your your viewer on a journey. Um, what you want to do to to capture your viewer's attention is you want to. Um, guide your viewer's eye. Um, you want your, your image to communicate something to your viewer, uh, perhaps even create an emotional response. Um, and this is really the place to, to, that you can make it happen. Um, so light and dark, you can use light and dark uh, to help direct your viewer's eye. Um, our eyes are, are naturally um, drawn to the brightest areas in the scene. Uh, so an image like this, um, I didn't have to do much editing to get it to look like this, but you know, I saw it, Olivia in this light, and um, you know, I knew that her eyes were just, her eyes are the, the, the subject here. Um, you know, and something like this, you know, her, you know, your eyes are drawn to um, you know, her smile and, and just the, you know, the brightness of the image. Color, color can um, is another tool that you use to draw the eye. It can distract the eye as well, though. Um, so an image like this, I think, is um, you know, I think it's okay compositionally, but you know, there's a lot of blues in the image, and I think um, it, it's, it's the blues become the color becomes a distraction at this point. So by altering the images and turning it to black and white, um, I think that helps. Uh, Bring your view, bring the viewer uh, more in on on Olivia here. Something else you can do is uh, creatively adjust the focus. Now you can do this with your lens, uh, you know how you, um, you know the f-stop that you use, um, you know the wider aperture, the shallower depth of field. Um, you can also do this creatively in post-production. Um, you know the eyes are the subject here, and you really and the the focus is. Is right at the eye, so that's um, you know that's what you're um, being drawn to. So something like this. This was done um, more in camera, but you know Olivia helping out with uh, cooking dinner, uh, cropping. You know uh, you can adjust, you can creatively crop to get uh, to draw the viewer in. You know something like this. You're eliminating distractions around her. So Olivia loves to open cabinets and sit in cabinets and do things with, you know, she'll often bring things over, open a cabinet, bring something over, and just sit there, uh, whether it's eating, you know, her goldfish crackers or things like that. So I think this is always a, this is always an image that makes me smile. Another thing to mention is is to not be a slave to the rules. Um, you know, we me I mentioned that you know these are more guidelines for for. Um, you know, to bring the, the most out of your image. Um, but, you know, something, I always say that, you know, throw out the rules when the image is personal. Um, you know, this image, I was testing a lens or something out, and Olivia just popped her head up into the, into the frame. You know, there's a lot of things about this that, you know, that are outside of those rules, but this image just, I always think of that moment, and um, I would never erase this. Um, because of that, it's it just um, it's something personal about it. So sharing moments, um, you know, I think of what really kind of brought me to this is just thinking about, um, you know, or going back to the to the beginning of the of the talk. What I mentioned is, um, you know, that there were a lot of I noticed that a lot of the image I've taken over the last year and a half were of Olivia. Um, and just there's also a lot of images on my hard drive that are just sitting there, so it really kind of made me think about um, you know why I'm going through the whole process of of capturing and, and editing images. 
Um, so I think it's it's important to, to think about why you're doing things like this. Um, you know, for for a live for this for these types of pictures, you know, these moments are for my family. My moments are the moments are for my wife, my myself, friends, um, and then one day Olivia. Um, but you know, it's a lot. Some images are not shared, and that's fine. Um, you know, some images are just are meant for exercise, and that's fine. Something some are meant for creative expression, and that's fine. But um, you know, I think. Uh, at least in my work, the majority of what I want to create, um, I want to be able to share. So, um, you know, in the context of Olivia, my my job is father and photographer. Um, so one day I hope these um, images have, you know, the same impact that the images my father made of me have uh, have had. Um, so that's part of really knowing your why. Um, how many people print at home? Okay. Um, have you ever had a hard time? Have you ever had a, an image that comes up that's not that doesn't match your screen? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all we've all been there. Um, you know, the first step I was mentioned the backbone is is the monitor calibration. Um, but you know, printing is an important part of our heritage as photographers. Um, you know, there's the, the process of creating something that we can actually hold in our hands um, is, I think, a, a very important part of the uh, part, very important part of photography. Um, so it gets you what it when you when you start printing, it gets you thinking about uh, when you're capturing images, it gets you thinking about print. Um, you're thinking about how this is going to look on ink instead of how it's going to look on your screen. Um, and I think that's really the, you know, again, our heritage as photographers is to create something that we can hold in our hands. Um, it turns it into to something permanent. It's not a, a, a file of, of um, you know, something that lives in a computer. It's something that can have life on a wall. Um, it gives, um, it, it's something that can be shared, it can be given. Um, you can, you know, another reason to print is you control the experience for your, for your uh, viewer, you know, if somebody's you know not calibrating the display, it's not going to look the same on your screen as it does on theirs. So by printing your, besides the the benefits of it um, uh, of the, the photographic process, is that you're controlling the the message or the the experience that your viewer has. Um, so I think it's definitely important to to, to be printing. Um, so I think uh, probably the first thing, you know, wrote, the next thing to talk about is, um, you know, sharing images today. Um, you know, there's a lot of sharing on, you know, social networks and, and that kind of thing. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people are, are very open about it. Um, I think in our case with Olivia, we've been very hesitant to share many images online. Um, and I think it's it's probably just wise to you know, to um, just to be very careful and not share uh, in certain, in you know, or overshare, I should say. Um, uh, you know, so that's not always a great to uh, a great avenue to share your images. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that because that's probably you know sharing memorable moments. That's probably the most obvious that comes through. Um, so you know, if you think about it, everything that you can put online today. Will be part of of history. Um, you know, you're creating your legacy by putting an image. Part of your legacy by creating it, or putting an image online. Um, you know, what's uh, you know what's shared today will be will be there tomorrow. Um, so even you know uh, you know even something like this that's that's being recorded. This is part of something that um, you know Olivia might look at in the future. Is um, you know this is part of. Uh, it's kind of neat to think that this is part of what her perception of of me and um, you know could be for the future. Is this is this is always probably going to be there. So um, so think about what you put online. I think that's probably the first thing people think about sharing. Um, but what just think about the the legacy that it creates for you. Um, uh, so uh, just 
kind of a cool thought that I mentioned uh, that I mentioned that. And, um, but you want to, you know, another way to share memorable moments is through a personal project. Uh, personal projects can be, uh, you know, something simple, but I define it as a single theme uh, in the same direction over a period of time. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, you know, I always like to to have, you know, the mental picture of um, if you're going to have a gallery show, if you're thinking about an open room that's um, that you're going to hang images. Uh, you know, what do you, what would you like to, uh, you know, if you had a, a, a gallery show anywhere, what would you like to show? What's, what's a, pri what's, you know, what's a collection of work that, that all relates to each other that you're going to show? Um, and a personal project, I think, and, you know, it doesn't have to be terribly rigid, um, but it's something that really kind of helps you develop a theme over a period of time. Um, for me, uh, a personal project I'm working on currently is uh, a book project on Old Car City. Um, it's going to be, you know, uh, more of a, a my vision for it is more of a coffee table type book. But it's, um, you know, a, a collection of my work that I've been doing. I've been going to Old Car City over the last uh, couple years. Old Car City is a, 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 it was a junkyard that was started in 1931 and operated until 1970, 75 or so, somewhere in there, and then just kind of left alone. There are thousands of cars. It's in white Georgia, um, so it's, uh, it's not around the corner, unfortunately. But there's just thousands of cars that are decaying. Um, and while the, while the junkyard was left alone, all these trees have just built up around it. So it's, you're basically in in the woods with all these old cars, everything's decaying. And it's, it's just a really cool place for, uh, it's, you know, we said a, a target rich environment. Um, definitely a great place to go photograph close ups and um, you know, even some macro stuff. Um, one of the, we, I mean, it's, this was a old car city for me. It was a, a place where I went on my first workshop um, and it just really had a very, um, you know, impact impacted my photography, and impacted who I am as a person. I think, um, and it got me. You know, it's another one of those those milestone moments that got me thinking about where I want to go photographically, and um, uh, so that was, you know, I think it was 2012 when I w went there, and then early in 2013, um, when I was there, my wife called me and told me that we were that she was pregnant with Olivia. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a place that that has a lot of meaning to me, and it's um, you know definitely means a lot to me to to, to put together a personal project uh, related to it. Um, how many people had a family member or um, somebody close to them in, introduce them to photography? Yeah, um, I often find that. You know, for me, obviously, it was my father. I mentioned that, um, but I find that it's all oftentimes family members, or um, you know, a parent, an uncle, an aunt. Um, you know, somebody that um, you know, there's somebody in the family that helps get you into photography. Um, and you know, one thing that I, another personal project that I'm working on um, is a film project for Olivia. Um, so my father, you know. Um, you know, captured rolls of black and white film, developed in the basement, and printed them in the basement. And um, you know, that's very special to me. You know, and then um, I have I'm doing the same for Olivia. So I just actually almost um, I wasn't able to get it in time. I would have loved to bring the book in and show you, um, but so I've I used a I, uh, shot a roll of black and white film over the last year and a half of Olivia. Um, so it's you know a shot here and there, but um, it's so that she would have something along the same vein as what I had um, when I grew up. Um, so I think it's it's really cool. It's um, really kind of kept. It's kind of given me a, a, a deeper connection with um, my childhood and the importance that photography played a role there. So um, you know I think we all have something that we can. Um, you know, think about working on as a as a project over a long period of time. So, it's definitely been uh, great for my my photography, and um, 
you know, certainly we encourage you to think about what to do or uh, you know, to, to kind of start working on a personal project if you haven't already. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is, is leaving a legacy. Um, you know, I mentioned my father. Um, you know, I certainly love it if one day that Olivia uh, got into photography and you know, enjoyed it as much as I do. But I at least want to pass on to her that you know, photography is an important part of, of, of a life. Um, photography is a very special thing, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's become, um, uh, you know, it, it's kind of very commonplace. We carry around phones that have great cameras on them today. And, you know, we always have a camera with us. I think that's, uh, that's really kind of a great thing for photography. We always have something to express ourselves with. Um, and so I think leaving a legacy is, is something that's important. You know, if there's somebody that we know in our lives that we can help influence um, and keep the tradition going on, I think that's important. Um, so I definitely hope that, um, you know, whether Olivia really takes the photography or not, I hope that someday that she um, at least realizes um, that's an important part of a life. Um, so I would just say, you know, find a way to pass on your passion. Um, I'm going to end with, with this. Um, you know, I didn't photograph people much, uh, you know, before Olivia. Um, and this is a post that I made uh, pretty shortly after her birth. Um, so I can say I consider my, this is a, a post that I made on my uh, website. Uh, I consider myself a landscape and architectural photographer, and I've traveled to some beautiful places to shoot. Every time I pick up my camera to make a photograph of Olivia, I can't imagine a better subject. Um, I think that really just kind of sums up what the last year and a half of my photographic life has been. Um, not that I don't enjoy landscapes and, and nature and that type of photography as much as I had before. Um, you know, I could often I make the case that I, I like it even more. I've definitely traveled some, for some great places over the last year and a half. Um, but one thing I found is a, a, new, a new passion for photography is um, you know, photographing um, Olivia. I think it's probably, can say it's pretty natural that you, know, you, know, uh, you have a daughter or, or son and you're obviously going to photograph them. Um, but I've started taking on other jobs of, of you know, photographing people. The skills that I've learned uh, photographing Olivia are things that can be passed on or passed through to you know, photographing uh, uh, you know, adults, headshots. Uh, I just did an um, engagement session uh, a couple days ago. Um, you know, it's really, it's found, you know, what I did, you know, thankfully through Olivia, she's, you know, shown me a, a different, something in photography that I didn't see before, uh, that I actually really do like enjoying photographing, that I do enjoy photographing people. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, I guess I would encourage, um, you know, encourage you guys to, to think about it. if there's something that you kind of, I don't want to say dread photographing or, or or maybe haven't had experience photographing, uh, so just give it a try. Um, you know, if you've if you haven't shot macro before, um, you know, take an hour or two uh, here in the next month and and you know find some small subjects to to photograph and light and try to do something with it that um, you know something with a subject that you hadn't done before. Um, so it's really um, you know it's been very influential in my life to find something new to photograph. Um, I knew I was going to photograph Olivia a lot, um, but I didn't realize, um, I knew how much I loved being Olivia's dad, but I didn't realize how much I loved Olivia, being Olivia's photographer. So um, definitely want to thank you for your time. Thank you for coming out. Um, and if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to go into, you know, whether it's about Olivia or photography or, or color management, I'm, I'm here for you guys. So. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.